Welcome back to another video here on the channel. This one has been requested by some of you and it's about learning how to learn. I talked a bit about what I've learned in my generalist versus specialist video. I believe that learning how we learn should be a subject or at least a workshop in every single school. I honestly have too much to say about this subject to put it all in one video. So I will split it in two. The first video will be about the two modes of thinking that we use when learning something new and how to nurture them as well as seven methods that led to the best results in scientific experiments. The biggest contributors for this video are Barbara Oakley's A Mind for Numbers and Understanding How We Learn, a visual guide by Jana Weinstein and Megan Sumeraki. In the second video we take a broader view and I'll talk about ultra-learning, meta-learning and some techniques that people use who became world-class in more than one area. I think that knowing the seven techniques explained in this video will give you a huge advantage. Students believe in different learning styles, that everyone should find out their own way how to learn. But this is not supported by science at all. There are techniques that perform better in experiments across the board. Learning something new involves two systems, focused thinking and diffuse thinking. You are never in both at the same time, but switching between them during the day. Both are essential. Professor Barbara Oakley came up with an easy to understand analogy for the two modes, a pinball machine. When in focus mode, we are intensely concentrating on a specific problem. This degree of concentration is often necessary, however it has some downsides. What if the solution to the problem you are trying to understand is not in the area you are currently thinking it is? The diffuse mode is a more relaxing state of thought that lets you see the big picture. You get closer to the point where the solution actually lies and then can use the focus mode to solve it. If you're trying to understand or figure out something new, your best bet is to turn off your precision focused thinking and turn on your big picture diffuse mode. But how? By first focusing on the task and then doing something that has nothing to do with it. Sleeping, working out, relaxing, listening to music, something like that. Your mind will still process the task in the background. This explains why we often have the greatest insights while we take a shower. There is nothing we focus on, but our brain is making new connections. Or if you play an instrument, you also must have noticed that before. You learn to play a new piece in the evening, try to get it right, but can't. You go to bed, get up the next morning and suddenly you are way better at playing the piece. This passive form of learning during unfocused activities like sleep is immensely powerful. Sleep is absolutely essential for learning anyway. Practice does not make perfect. It is practice followed by a night of sleep that leads to perfection. If you don't sleep the very first night after learning, you lose the chance to consolidate those memories, even if you get lots of catch-up sleep thereafter. The shift between the focused and diffuse mode lets you build a stronger foundation in your understanding. If you try to cram in everything you want to learn at once, these bricks are the representation of your brain. Reading a lot of different things helps you to form many analogies in the back of your head that you subconsciously have at your disposal to understand new problems in a variety of contexts. Legendary investor Charlie Munger famously said, I don't know anyone who's wise who doesn't read a lot. As long as I have a book in my hand, I don't feel like I'm wasting time. I explained the consequences of this in a different video. David Epstein found that wide range of experiences make you a better learner in general. Generalists are better problem solvers because they have been exposed to more analogies that they can transfer to problems outside of their previous field. So to learn something we use two different modes, focused thinking and diffuse thinking. But learning itself also consists of two systems, that is memorization and understanding. Memorization means turning short-term memory into long-term memory. French vocabulary doesn't need a lot of understanding, but is completely focused on memory, just as playing a song on the piano as a beginner is relying on muscle memory instead of understanding the structure of the music. On the other hand, understanding, not simply memorizing, concepts from the ground up. If you can't explain a concept or idea, you don't understand it. So let's look at the seven different techniques. Two for memory, four for understanding and one that combines the two. The term already explains what's going on. Instead of cramming in all information at once, you space it out to different days and repeat what you have studied. This is great for learning vocabulary of a new language. A great book that I can recommend for that is Fluent Forever. It's also useful for facts that you need to memorize and motor skills necessary to learn instruments or movements in sports. The free software Anki is an awesome spaced repetition tool that structures your learning sessions for you. We typically see the benefits of spaced repetition after a bit of a delay, such as one or two days, rather than on an immediate test. So start learning early enough and not a few days before the test. Rather than studying very similar information in one study session, you might take things that are somewhat related but not too similar and mix things up by studying those ideas in various orders. 
This is great for motor skills, math and again musical instruments. Typically, interleaved practice produces poorer accuracy and speed during learning, but improved accuracy and speed on a later testing session compared to blocked practice. Why exactly interleaving works as a learning technique is not really clear yet, just as the level of the similarity the problems should have is not precisely defined. You shouldn't switch between Spanish vocabulary and calculus though. This technique involves asking yourself why and how something works. One of the most potent manipulations that can be performed in terms of increasing a subject's memory for material is to have the subject elaborate on the to-be-remembered material. Richard Feynman, who is not only one of the greatest physicists, but also one of the greatest teachers that ever lived, used this technique a lot. Therefore, it's also known as the Feynman technique. Dr. Feynman used a tough process on himself where if he didn't really understand something, he would push himself. Do I understand this boundary case? Do I understand why we don't do it this other way? Do I really understand this? And because he had pushed himself to have such a deep understanding, his ability to take you through the path of the different possibilities was incredible. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon, and if they get near each other, they snap together. If you can get it faster, by heating it up somehow, some way, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in. And that gives a lot of jiggly motion, which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms. And they jiggle and they make mothers jiggle and you get a terrible catastrophe. That catastrophe is a fire. I would advise to anyone to read his book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. It's incredibly inspiring and full of humor. The guy had an intellectual curiosity that is unmatched and had tons of fun on the way. We should all aim to be a little more like him. I use this technique quite a lot when I write video scripts about complex subjects like Bitcoin where the explanations need to go from zero to one. When you just think about things, you make leaps in your thought process. When you have to write them down or explain them to others, these leaps become apparent to yourself and you need to fill them to make your reasoning logical. So when I write a video script, there's always moments where I'm like, so wait a second, I, I concluded this and, and that, but, but why actually? Why, why did I conclude this? Where, how did I get to this conclusion? So sometimes I realize I can't really explain it, which means I don't really understand it. Which means, time to do some more research on this gap of knowledge. So through writing I question my understanding a lot, and I know that people would absolutely realize it if I tried to explain something I didn't fully grasp. The next technique is self-explanation, which is similar to elaborative interrogation. It's about thinking out loud to explain how you solve a problem step by step. This is most helpful in natural sciences like math and physics. It's often necessary in coding interviews when you want to apply for a position as a software engineer, for example. You get a list of problems that you need to solve, but the interviewers are only partly interested in the solution. They are often more interested in the way you grasp the problem and explain your thought process to get to the conclusion. Research has found that college students who engaged in self-explanation while trying to solve physics problems showed better understanding of the concepts on a later test. Similar results were found with elementary school students learning to solve word problems in math with better performance in the self-explanation group on both an immediate test and a test one month after initial study. We understand concrete examples and narratives better than abstract concepts. Or in Nassim Taleb's words, we favor the visible, the embedded, the personal, the narrated and the tangible. We scorn the abstract. Concrete examples are good to understand the application of an idea, but often leave you without a real understanding of the idea itself. You start reasoning by analogies that often only represent a surface understanding instead of the underlying links. Having more example at your disposal helps to find the common ground and understand the abstract concept better. Dual coding is the idea of combining more than one sense in your learning. For example this video, which is verbal and visual. Dual coding theory is the idea that when we combine text information and visual information, our learning is enhanced because we process verbal and visual information through separate channels. But be aware of cognitive overload. Binge-watching educational videos surpasses your capacity to process information and you will neither understand nor remember anything anymore at some point. And last but not least, retrieval practice. Your memory works in a way that you don't just simply remember things, your brain reconstructs them. If you take a test, you don't just remember, you reconstruct and thereby enhance your memory. As you can see, memorization and understanding are linked here. However, the format of retrieval doesn't have to be a test. Really anything that involves bringing information to mind from memory improves learning. By just thinking about what you learned every now and then, you will learn even more. 
Retrieval practice also helps the students use the information more flexible in the future, applying what they know in new situations. What makes retrieval practice such a valuable strategy is that it helps promote meaningful learning and is not just for memorization of facts. If you would like to see another video on learning, please subscribe to the channel because as I said, there will be a part 2. This one will revolve around Scott Young's ultra learning technique, plus insights from Tim Ferriss' meta learning, plus insights from John Waitzkin. I will also discuss effectiveness and efficiency in that video. That's it, I hope you learned something because this video is about learning. If you did, please leave a like and I see you next time.